I'm going to introduce Janine Smith. I keep wanting to call her Turner. Yeah. But a uh, famous actress. It's, it's that, a resemblance, obviously. It, it, it is, but Janine Smith, she's renowned here in, uh, as far as photo uh, preservation and restoration. She's got, a, if I'm not mistaken, a photo right now of, hang, of General Worth hanging in City Hall. It was presented uh, two or three months ago down at City Hall in front of the council, and it's now in the, in the chambers, or down in the hall there at, yeah. at City Hall. Over the chambers. Over the chambers, yeah. So uh, she's, she's very well known. She's, she's uh, unique in, that, in her profession, and she's very good at it. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Janine for our workshop on photograph preservation and restoration. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Janine, and I am the owner of Land Island CPR, which is a photo restoration company here in Fort Worth. I'm actually co-owner, along with my mother, Caroline, who's in the back. And today we are going to talk about photo conservation, preservation, and restoration, or photo CPR and maybe give you some ideas about what you can do to keep your family photo collections alive. First, I wanna kind of apologize because this is the first run through of this particular presentation. So I usually am a little more dynamic than sitting here reading a page. So you're kind of my guinea pigs and I do apologize in advance for that. First, let's talk about conservation. First, let's talk about conservation. Not so much the literal meaning of conservation, the, pre the prevention of injury, decay, waste, or loss, more like a twist on that. That twist is conservation through repatriation, bringing back as much as we can of that which has been lost. In a while, we'll trace a family photo collection through the years and see what happens to it as it disperses. But first, let's take a little side trip back to the dawn of photography. Now, prior to 1825, perhaps as far back as the sixth century BC, there was experimentation of various techniques which could be termed photographic. But every attempt to uh, expose those disappeared as soon as light hit it. These are the first permanent, and see this didn't come out right there on the bottom, obviously. These are the first permanent photographs ever taken, and both are by a man named Joseph Niesifor Nieps. On the left is an image that he took of a painting, and on the right is an image he took out of a window of a roof line a year later. And it's kind of astounding that these were taken in 1825 and 1826. The 1826 photograph hasn't held up really well. The, uh, it, it, just, it just hasn't, it just looks bad. But the image on the bottom is actually a watercolor of that photograph so you can see what it was supposed to look like. Yay! Daguerreotypes were the first commercially successful photographic process. A direct positive made in the camera on a silver copper plate, daguerreotypes were mounted in cases or frames under glass. Other later processes, such as ambrotypes and tintypes, could be mounted the same way, but daguerreotypes are, stand out due to their, their quality. Their mirror-like surface usually stays incredibly sharp and clear. If you've seen daguerreotypes that look all scratched and messy, that's usually the glass itself, not the picture. Uh, those, and if it is the picture, they've been taken out of the case, which is something you should never do without a professional, by the way. That can really mess them up. Invented by Louis Daguerre, the man here on the right, and our friend from the first permanent photograph, Niesifor Nieps, daguerreotype process was inefficient for, for portraits at first, because it took up to 15 minutes to expose. And for that 15 minutes, people had to stay perfectly still. Their face, everything. Now you try staying perfectly still for 15 minutes and you'll see why most of them didn't look all that happy. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The exposure time was soon brought down to around a minute and then the most influential people all had their daguerreotypes taken. 
including Abraham Lincoln, who had a number of that process portrait done. Not only the rich and powerful were getting their likeness made with daguerreotypes, though, for the cost of two to five dollars, anybody could be immortalized, and many were. There's usually at least one daguerreotype left in any family photo collection today. By 1860, the daguerreotype process was virtually gone from the photographic landscape, having been taken over by processes such as the ambrotype and the tintype. Actually made from iron, not tin, tintypes made the photographic process a lot easier because the drying time was a lot less. This meant that photographers could go to carnivals and fairs and take pictures outside the studio in a short amount of time. They were much lighter than daguerreotypes and so soon took over in popularity. They didn't have to be mounted in glass cases and oftentimes they were put in just a paper frame or a sleeve and they were less delicate. So that made them much cheaper to produce. Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. Scientifically, how did it make the copy of the image? Now what, how did okay, the... Like if, how does that happen? How do you make the copy and what happens scientifically? In the original process? Yes. I don't know. You don't know. I, okay. I don't know. I, I don't do photography and I don't do vintage photography. Okay. Um, are you talking about the tintypes? Or? Well, any of them. How does a camera make a picture? It, it has to, it sees it and it uses light to put it on the, the film or the glass plate or whatever was in the camera. So it sees it like our it, eyes it, do? It uses, it sees what our eyes do, but backwards okay. in the beginning. And then it was exposed onto the film or the glass plate, which had been coated with a chemical, a chemical uh, coating, and then the light exposed it onto either the glass plate or the film. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay, unlike the costly daguerreotype, which $5 was more than a week's pay for most people at that time. The tintype along with the amber type only cost around 25 cents. The two and a quarter by four inch carte de visite or CDV became popular in the 1860s. They were used as advertisements as well as calling cards and were often used to raise money by notables such as Sojourner Truth. Carts to visit were also the first trading card. People loved to collect and trade CDVs of celebrities such as uh, Abraham Lincoln and Queen Victoria and Ulysses S. Grant. In fact, Queen Victoria was an avid collector and had over 100 albums of CDVs. In the mid-1870s, the CDV process was taken over by the four and a quarter by six and a half inch cabinet card. They were actually more of a advertisement for the photographer himself because they always had the studio name on the front and often on the back. But they were very popular until about the 1890s. Family photo collections will no doubt have a number of all of these photographic processes. Another item that will have a presence in most collections is the convex oval or crayon portrait. Y'all have seen some of these, right? The bubble glass. These were popular from the late 1800s until the 1920s, but they were still being done as late as the 1940s or 50s. They're weakly developed photographs on something that's like a really thin cardboard and they needed to be gone over with crayon or pastels or watercolor to bring the picture out. And there were actually, there's some really good examples of some really bad artists in some of these. <laughs> if you've seen some of them, they, they don't look very good. But it was then subjected to humidity and bent in, so it would go in the bubble glass frame. And they were also a little bit of the scam of the day when they first came out because they were so inexpensive, anybody could get one, and they'd go to carnivals and fairs, and the photographer would take their picture, or the photographer could travel out to the farm and take the picture of the family or the farm itself. And then when they came back with the exposed picture, 
Well, that's when they got them because they, they had to go in the bubble glass frame. And the bubble glass frame cost a lot of money and they were pretty elaborate. So that's where the scam came in. But they were very popular. And again, there's probably going to be at least one of these in, in most family collections. These portraits were also done by enlarging existing photos and sometimes even combining two images into one. Okay. In 1888, the Eastman Kodak Company came out with what would spark a revolution in the photographic industry, the Kodak box camera. Made of cardboard or plastic, the box was so simple, its slogan was, you press the button, we do the rest. The Kodak cost $25, which in that time the average monthly income was around $225, so this was not cheap. It came with preloaded 100 exposure film, and when you took all 100 of your pictures, you sent the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel, back to Rochester, New York, to Eastman Kodak, and they exposed the film and developed it, and then they sent the pictures back to you and the box with another load of 100 exposure film in it. So it was, it was really a rather expensive hobby for that time but it brought photography out of the studio and into the home. In 1900, Eastman Kodak came out with the brownie. Initially aimed at children, the little brownie came with a roll of six exposure film and cost only one dollar. Developing cost was 75 cents and a new roll of film, six exposures, cost 15 cents, so nearly everyone could afford a brownie. Considered to be by many the most important camera ever made. Because of its simplicity and ease of use, it could be operated by any schoolboy or girl after all. The brownie is the camera that gave birth to the snapshot. The box in the brownie gave people the ability to take pictures anywhere. And boy did they ever. Holidays, vacations, new clothes, new babies, pets, friends, even war. Kodak had an ad campaign encouraging soldiers going off to World War I to take their camera and send pictures back. And it also encouraged the families back home to take pictures to send to their soldiers. Needless to say, family photo collections started getting larger and larger when photography came into the home. Along with the cameras, other inventions were coming into their own around that time. Henry Ford introduced the first affordable automobile in 1908, and pretty soon they were everywhere and people were going everywhere in them. And when they were going everywhere, they were taking their cameras along with them. And, and snapping more and more pictures and the collections were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So by now you see this is how your shoe boxes and everything you have at home got to be so full. Ease of travel and more opportunities after World War II caused more people to pack up and move away from the places their families had lived for generations. When people moved, pieces of the family collections moved with them. Inevitably, family members could lose touch, and as subsequent generations came and went further and further, it was even more so. Now we're going to take a tiny little side trip and see how far flung a family's photo collection can get. We're going to use my own family as an example here, but it's pretty much like anybody's uh, moving around over the years. These are my great-great-grandparents, John Adam, called Adam, and Elizabeth Smith. Adam came to America from Alsace, France and his, with his mother and father and the rest of the family in 1848. They settled in Cattaraugus County, New York, and in 1862, Adam enlisted in the Army of the Potomac. Adam kept a journal during the war, and from this we know he had a photograph that was taken on February 25, 1863. He was captured by the Confederate Army on July 1, 1863, the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, and he was marched down south to Belle Island, Virginia. He spent 21 months as a prisoner, being moved around prisons in Virginia, South Carolina, and Georgia, and spent most of his time in Andersonville. While there, he kept writing in his diary and carved a pipe from a root he dug up on which he placed the names of all the places he'd been held prisoner. <coughs> 
After his parole, Adam became what we would call a character. <laughs> he loved being the center of attention, and he loved to talk about his time in the Civil War and his internment, and he would talk to anybody and tell anyone the story. There are a number of newspaper articles from the hometown newspapers that we found <coughs> that tell us in them he made mention of some family heirlooms. We know about the pipe, of course, and the journal. He also mentioned various medals of the commemorative variety from the Gettysburg and GAR reunions, which he apparently never missed, the gun he used in duty, and the family Bible that the Smiths brought from Germany. I've never actually seen any of these things. I've heard about some of them and been sent pictures of others. And I recently found a cousin who uh, sent me photocopies of the Smith family Bible. So I know they exist. I don't know where all of them are. Some of these things, though, including the likeness of Adam that was taken in 1863, nobody knows anymore if it even exists or where it is. Anyway, Adam, being the character he was, also loved having his picture taken and apparently took it a lot. And again, we don't know where all those are. But I imagine there was a nice little collection of memorabilia amassed during his and Elizabeth's lifetime. Now, all this time, the Smith family stayed in or around the same area of New York, <laughs> in Cattaraugus, in New York. Adam and Elizabeth had eight children, and they pretty much stayed their whole life in the same general area, going pretty much no further than Niagara County. So when the legacy was dispersed in eight different ways after Elizabeth died, everything stayed basically in the same area. The third generation consisted of 28 grandchildren who, like their parents, stayed pretty close to the family homestead. But by the fourth, things began to change. In the years during and after World War II, a large percentage of the 108 grandchildren joined the military or found better opportunities further away. This is just a small sampling of the directions they went. This represents just 10 of the 12 children in one family unit, my father and his siblings, just 10 out of 108. So they started going all over the place. <laughs> By the fifth generation, now, okay, this, this is my generation. There were at least 432 of us. 432 being just the amount that, that I can figure out. Okay, I, I, there's probably more. <laughs> They're very prolific. Adam and Elizabeth's original collection has now possibly been dispersed and bequeathed a huge amount of times by now. My father was estranged from his family, and this is actually the children, uh, my father and his brothers and sisters. He was estranged from the family, so I haven't received anything from that original legacy or any legacy since. But there are many, many others who have. So there could be a lot of bits and pieces out there that myself and the cousins that I know don't know anything about. No doubt parts of the original legacy, the original collection, have been lost forever. Some to time and decay through improper storage, rough handling, and perhaps natural disasters. Some have probably been thrown away or sold. It happens all the time when people receive a legacy they aren't ready for, that they don't appreciate yet, or that they see no value in. So they just throw it away because they haven't got room or they just really don't care. Or it even could have been stolen and the thieves thought it was uh, no, of no value and they threw it away, or it could have been sold for beer money. You know, like I said, these things happen. Some precious bits of family history even end up in <laughs> even end up in stores or online as parts of arts and crafts. Most people who do this sort of thing are responsible and make copies of the images to use, but there are some who use the originals and make it part of the selling quality that they are originals and they're one of a kind. These are actually things I pulled offline 
those little books over there use these beautiful cabinet cards as the covers of journals and the person who made them was uh, kind enough to tell everybody that they were unwanted photographs that had been given to a heritage society and the heritage society didn't want them anymore so threw them away. And these framed, this framed bit is uh, from a pretty well-known artist, I gather, and she takes the originals and cuts the people out and uses original old documents as the background and turns the people into fairies and things like that. So these things happen, even though they shouldn't. I have, I have my own thoughts on that. <laughs> I dare say that very few of us know where every piece of their family's memorabilia is. I do know of one family in Weatherford that has probably pretty close to their whole collection, and it's massive. But when you're not, what if you're not so lucky? What if you want to find more? What if you want to see what's out there, maybe, and perhaps even look into the face of an ancestor you've never seen? Well, this is where repatriation comes in. Here are a few ideas where you can start to reconnect the missing pieces of your family collection. You can get together with your relatives and compare photographs, collectibles, and stories to see if anyone has anything you don't have or has heard of anything, like family Bibles, for instance, that no one has seen or hasn't seen for a long time. If you have reunions, you can make a photo search part of the fun, and if you don't have reunions, it could be a good excuse to start. Make it a project or a quest to find things no one has seen. Make the quest last the year between reunions, if you like. Send out a newsletter to update everyone on any progress and find clues and follow them down, sort of like a family photo detective agency. Track down and contact new cousins. This is always a great way to find missing pieces. Consider having a DNA test and join a surname DNA project to find cousins. Search orphan photo sites. And what's an orphan photo site, you may ask? They're foundlings, photos people have found in antique stores, flea markets, estate sales, and garbage cans. These sites are searchable sometimes by family names or the states they were found in. And some give the original image back to the family, sometimes for a small fee to cover their cost, and some will make a copy to send to the family. And it's, it's just worth a try to try it. I've never found one personally, a uh, family photo there, but I do know people who actually have. These are sites run by people who really care about old photos and repatriating them with their families. Most of them also have Facebook pages where they can interact with people and some will do lookups for you for images they don't have online yet. I have a printout available in the room where we're going to have a little get together after with uh, <coughs> listings of some of the best of these sites if you're interested. One last thing on the orphans. Maybe the next time you see some old photos at a flea market or an antique store or something, you could buy them and perhaps donate to, to an orphan site, or you can just save them from some mad crafter out there who wants to <laughs> turn them into a fairy. <laughs> They're somebody's relatives. They deserve to not be fairies. There's a, bit, there's a bit about getting some of your family photo collection back. Now let's talk about what to do to preserve the original photos that you already have. Okay, the first thing you need to ask is where are your pictures? Are they stored in boxes, drawers, in the attic, in the basement? I see somebody nodding up there. Yes, all that. Okay. Are they under your bed? Are they still in the original photo albums? Where they are stored can be potential time bombs to your photos. Boxes, unless archival, are acidic. Okay, photo album pages are acidic. Acid eats paper. Photos are printed on paper. So the acid is eating your photos. Too much humidity or heat are picture killers. And keeping them in drawers or boxes, other than all that, can invite uh, creases and tears and cracks if you go in to find them and pick them up. So what should you be storing them in? And the operative word here is archival. 
Archival products are non-acidic and made to help preserve their contents like what a museum would use. There are archival solutions for just about everything you can think of. Photographs, negatives, textiles, documents, books, magazines, newspapers. Virtually anything you need to store, everything in your collection. There are even resealable archival bags and desiccant packets to keep the moisture away. While I believe museum quality archival storage is best, even photo storage boxes you get in any store now are pretty much all uh, archival or non-acidic. Okay, they're not going to be museum quality, but they're non-acidic. You just have to look for that on the box and make sure that's what they are before you buy it. But see, there, there is a little, a little better solution if you can't get all the uh, really expensive stuff. But where can you get museum quality archival storage? There are quite a few places online, such as print file university products and archival products, to name just a few. And yes, even the container store. Okay, so uh, the container store is a good choice if you don't like shopping online. It's a local solution, and they're the ones with those neat little resealable bags and the desiccant packets, so they, they have some nice stuff. I just found that recently and was a little surprised, but I'm glad they do. I also have uh, some catalogs in the other room from archival products if you just want to take one and look through to see what kind of things are available. And these things are also available at better art supply stores like Blick. They have uh, archival products also. So storage of your original images is just one part of the archival process. Because archival storage will not stop photographs and documents from deteriorating, they will merely slow the process down, okay? Then archiving things digitally is crucial. The first step to digital archiving is scanning. Not all scanners are created equal. Different scanners will give you different quality scans. A cheap or cheaper scanner might be fine for just regular scanning. But archival scanning means you should be striving for it the very highest quality you can because this is your archive. After all, in 25 years, this may be the only surviving record of these images in existence. If you're scanning your own images, the cost of a good scanner, sometimes it's usually between five and $600, may be too much, especially if you just have a few items. If you have a bigger collection, it might be worth it. But if you only do have a few pieces and it's not worth the cost, you might want to look into outsourcing. Before you entrust your photos to someone else, there are a few things you need to think about. Online scanning services require you, of course, to send your photos into them through the mail or delivery service. Even most local scanning services, such as those offered through frame shops, send the images away to be scanned. Personally, I wouldn't trust it. You know, stuff happens and you don't know what's gonna happen. You could send them off to be scanned only to never see them again. I know, this hap I know somebody this happened to and all she got for her box of original images was $15 because that's all the post office felt they were worth because they were just bits of paper and worth nothing to them. Uh, I also know of a few instances where images were damaged at the scanning service or lost and the scanning service can even say they never got that picture and when you send your things to the uh, scanning service you have to um, agree to the you have to do their agreement their toss that says they are not uh, liable for any damage or loss or anything whatsoever for your pictures. It's, you know, chances are everything is going to be fine, but it's really, it's like playing Russian roulette with your pictures. And once they're gone, you're not going to get them back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, depending on how old or delicate your pictures are, you need to be aware of the scanning service that you choose if they use a flatbed or a sheet-fed scanner. Older photos, and let's just say for the sake of argument, anything before 1950, that's a, that's a good cutoff should never go in a sheet-fed scanner, the ones that go through the top. They should always go on a flatbed scanner. 
And that also goes for any photos that have tears, rips, creases, you know, pieces out, anything. You get caught in there, it's, it's gone. Tape. <laughs> anything but a pristine, rather new picture. <clears throat> and I say 1950 just because that's a, that's a fairly good cutoff. It's uh, really up to what shape it's in. Now, sheet loading scanners are incredibly fast, and if all you're scanning are newer images in good shape, it could be the way to go, especially since we've got a really good local scan source for this sort of thing here in town called Memory Giggles Scanning Service. And they, they whip these out so fast, and they've got really good prices. Again, though, this service is for newer photos in good shape. <clears throat> and they're at MemoryGiggles.com. For older photos, documents, and negatives, you'll need another source. So think local and one that does the work in-house. It may take some calling around to find, and it won't be as cheap as the big outfits, but your memories will certainly be safer. I do some scanning, although I usually do it in conjunction with restoration, and I've done some uh, large bulk scanning, big lots, and if you do have big batches, check with the local service and make sure they will give you a good rate for more photos. The big scanning services do that and you shouldn't be paying just a flat rate. If you have a hundred pictures, the rate should go down. And I'm not sure of all the local services because I do my own scanning, so I really can't give you <clears throat> a lead on that. Now let's talk about scanner settings. This is both for if you do it yourself or somebody else is scanning for you, you can check that they will do this archivally. <clears throat> Archival scanning calls for different settings than normal scanning. For instance, the resolution needs to be higher. If you're scanning a picture to put up on the internet, you want to keep the resolution to six, or, excuse me, 72 DPI. And when I say DPI, I'm going to probably interchange and switch to PPI because that's what I say. It's the same thing. It all stands for resolution. DPI is a printer's uh, term for dots per inch. If you're using an inkjet printer, it sprays the dots. And the higher resolution, it sprays more dots per inch. PPI is a digital term. And since I'm a digital artist, that stands for pixels per inch because I work with pixels. So don't let that confuse you if I slip. And I will say PPI. <clears throat> anyway, you want to keep your online ones at 72 DPI or PPI in case somebody uh, takes your picture and off and wants to make a print of it. If you do it at 72, it's going to look horrible. You always want to keep your online pictures at that. <clears throat> okay, if you are scanning your picture to, or excuse me, if you're printing your picture or enlarging it, you want to keep it at you know 600 ppi make it a nice picture for restoration i use 600 ppi for the nice clear resolution our archival scanning is different you want the best possible quality for your archive and you need a very high resolution you could probably get by with 600 but 900 to 1200 is what you're really wanting to look for once your photos go through the scanner, they need to be saved. Most people just save the, to the default file format, which is going to probably be JPEG. Okay, please don't when you're archiving. There are two kinds of compression algorithms. There's lossless and lossy. Okay, lossless compression algorithms reduce the file size while preserving a perfect copy of the uncompressed image while lossy preserves a representation of the original and it looks like it's a perfect copy but it's not if if you do that in a lossy format every time you open it it's going to lose a little quality every time you open a jpeg picture and look at it or send it to somebody it breaks down just a little bit okay just <laughs> Does something to the file? Every time. It's 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 the algorithm. There are some there are some JPEG um, compressions that don't, but for the sake of argument, you know, it not many people save to JPEG two thousand. And that's a little more lossless. See, I can get real technical on you. 
<laughs> but yeah, just just for the sake of argument. Yes. So what was the term? Can you spell it? I don't know anything. What lossy and lossless? Lossless. Lossless. Now, what are you wanting the? You said there were two kinds. Loss, yeah. Lossless and something else before that. Lossless. It means it loses no <coughs> compression. It's lossless or lossy. L O S S Y or L O S S L E S S. Do you click on something here? How so, do you get it? So, what kind of a format do you think that as opposed to JPEG? Okay. Next. <laughs> <laughs> D. Okay. When dealing with photographs, there are only two file formats you really need to worry about. JPEG and TIFF, and JPEG <laughs> is a lossy for, uh, format, and you should really only use that when you're going to put things up online at your 72 DPI, because it doesn't matter if it loses quality. Anything archival, TIFF, T-I-F, is what you want to deal with, and that's the only thing you should consider. That is a lossless format. And it's never going to, no matter how many times you open it, it's always going to stay just as pristine. All the pixels are going to be perfect. Another setting you should pay attention to while scanning is the bit depth or the color depth. This means the, um, the number of bits used to indicate the color of one single pixel. This is getting real technical, but in other words, the higher the bit depth, the brighter and richer the color. Most computer monitors and people can only see at a 24-bit depth, okay? Any higher, and experts can tell the difference, but you and I really can't. When scanning for print, for example, a 24-bit depth is fine. If you're just, you're just going to print your pictures, 24-bit is fine. Archival scanners, scanning, scanning, should be at 24 bits. If you can't see the difference, why should you do it? Well, it's like the file format. If you need to do any tweaking on your image at all, and by you I mean maybe your great-great-grandchildren, opening the file, doing something to it, sending it to someone, opening it again, closing it, whatever. If you use anything less than the 48 bits, it's going to lose quality. Yes? If you have sepia tone or black and white, do you really care about how does that color depth like you do yes. when you've got color? Yes. Still care about yes. It here. Because the only way black and white, you don't, you don't make a difference in black and white is if you have it in grayscale. You don't want it in grayscale. Even, that's another good point though, even if you're scanning a black and white image, scan it in color at a high bit depth. Because it's going to have a richer depth of the, of the blacks and the whites, because there aren't just two colors of black and white. It's many, you know, they're different tones. And if you do something to it later, uh, like digital restoration, if you do it in color, you have a lot more options. If you do it in grayscale, half of the things you want to do, you're not going to be able to do. Anyway, 48 bits for archival, the best, uh, just the highest amount of bit depth and resolution you can get. And if you do this, your future generations are going to thank you. One drawback of these very high resolutions and high bit depths is they create huge files. Okay, these aren't something you're going to want to store on your hard drive. If you want to keep local files of your images to work on and to share, save them at a lower resolution, about 300 PPI is probably fine, and a 24-bit depth. That'll keep the file size a little, little lower. So what are you going to do with all these really big archival files you've got? The first thing you want to do is find a suitable medium to store them on. After going through all this trouble to make these perfectly clear, wonderful, high files, you need to find something that is going to be suitable for that. There are quite a few options, but look for the best you can afford of anything. And if you're like if you're doing a CD, you go for a archival gold CD. This is actually coated in 24 karat gold, okay? And it's it's supposed to last 
300 years, which brings me to a, another thing here. Remember these? Okay. Remember to check your storage media every 10 years or so and transfer them to something, it, when something becomes uh, the new standard, when it becomes the new standard, because you don't want future generations trying to find the equivalent of an eight-track tape deck to look at the images that you've had so much trouble getting in a good way. And technology changes. Finally, whatever you, whenever you do decide to store your archive on, whatever, make at least two copies of your archive and then store one off-site, at least one off-site, uh, in a very safe place, maybe even a safety deposit box. As I said earlier, things happen beyond our control and should something like a fire or flood happen where your originals are stored or even one of your archival copies, you'll have a pristine archival copy safe. One last thought, as you're going through your images and scanning them, remember to write down the information, like maybe who the people are, where the photo was taken, what year, whatever you know about it, uh, even if you don't know who the people are in the photograph and you uh, talk to great aunt Myrna and she says, I think that so and so, write that down. Then you take a, make a copy of the image and put that data on a sheet with it and make a binder with all these and keep it with your archival copy. So you have a little, a little library of your images. And that way maybe you can do away with some of the who is this problems in the future. Now we're going to talk about restoration for just a minute. More specifically, digital restoration. First, what digital restoration is not. Okay, it's not taking someone out and it's not adding someone in. And these are, these really, these are <laughs> real pictures. Mussolini up there didn't want the, uh, the poor guy holding the horse's head to show up in. He wanted to look more heroic. <laughs> it's not uh, putting a lot of different pictures together to make one, and it's not cutting things out to rewrite history, as the one on the bottom. And it's not adding color to an old picture. These things are customizations or modifications. Some of them can be part of restoration, like color, uh, colorization, and some of them should never ever be like trying to rewrite history through a photograph. Most importantly, digital restoration is not working on the original image. These poor people in these images all had faces before untrained people got over-enthusiastic with the Q-tips. Only a trained professional with a degree in conservation should ever work on your originals. Uh, anything, anything else, anything less, is taking too big a chance with your original picture. If anyone cares at all about their photographs or documents, textiles, or anything in your collection, you will never have anyone less than a trained professional work on your originals. Uh, I am not a trained conservator, and I've had many people ask me or just assume that I work on originals. Uh, when I tell them I never do, they either act like the digital process isn't real, or th sometimes they even get a little mad at me, and they even try to talk me into it. <clears throat> Some remain unconvinced no matter what I say, and I assume go elsewhere to have their original worked on by somebody else. Well, I wish them the best of luck, but uh, if they don't go to a trained professional, uh, they'll more than likely either get someone who says they work on originals and they will take a picture of the original and work on the negative, or they will find somebody who's been trained in conservation via Google. The first is fine, but you may not get your original back if they don't tell you their process they could give you a, a new original, okay? And the, the second, uh, the Google-trained conservators, I wouldn't 
take a chance there. There are sites all over that tell you how to clean tin types and how to open your daguerreotype case. And, well, that might be what happened right there. And once it's gone, it's gone. There are two types of uh, chemicals on tin types, by the way. One works well when you use water on it, and the other, you put water on it, and your picture's gone. What digital photo restoration is, is rendering your original image into digital format by scanning or uh, photography and working on the digital file in Photoshop or another imaging process. Ha uh, leaving your, it leaves your original untouched and it's bringing the image back to life without altering it dramatically. I've never understood why some people are so dead set against digital photo restoration, but I think it might be a little bit uh, like when digital cameras came out and film photographers were very adamant that it wasn't real, but now most of those photographers are realizing digital cameras take nice pictures. Okay. Um, Digital restoration gives the ability to get much more depth and detail retrieval than working on an original. And there are, there are just so many things you can do in <laughs> digital restoration to bring a picture out. You couldn't do this uh, working on the original. Okay. And this is uh, Major James Handley, by the way, who Handley, Texas was named after. Digital restoration is going back in time a little taking your photos back to the time when they were not brand new, but in better shape, certainly. And when the restoration process is over, the untouched original can be archivally stored so that it will last a little longer, which brings up another great thing about digital restoration. And this uh, next thing is the picture that Betty was talking about. Uh, you can print your restoration and display it so that the original is safe away from the light and other things that can harm it. If you have it framed up in your house, the light's going to fade it even faster, okay? So, and uh, it will hasten the rate of decay. Uh, as Betty said, this is the picture that I restored of General Worth that is hanging in City Hall and the original <laughs> is safe and sound in a museum. Thank you. <laughs> All these befores and afters that Unless I tell you otherwise, unless they're bad, they're mine. <laughs> How do you feel about changing the size after you do this? Do you think it should be reproduced I'm, the same size it was? I'm fine with changing the size if that's what the customer wants. Because it doesn't, that doesn't change the, you're not changing the original photograph. You know, and so you still have your original. And if somebody wants it enlarged, they enlarge pictures all the time. You know, a lot of people have their original photographs and enlargements of that photograph. Uh, so I'm, I'm fine with that. Now, obviously, I think digital restoration is the best thing going. I'm biased. But if you should decide to have some photos digitally restored, I'd like you to keep a few things in mind when you're looking for the restoration artist that fits your needs. Digital photo restoration is a fairly new art form. And as of right now, there is no standardization, uh, no standardized training, although I hope to help change that in the future. I'd like to see some sort of certification eventually, but right now it's a bit of a crapshoot. <coughs> and uh, it's a crapshoot on how good your artist is or isn't. There's a misconception out there that restoration is something anyone can do if they own any kind of editing software uh, at all. I used to get multiple emails each week from people who wanted to work for themselves, had a copy of Photoshop Elements, and wanted me to give them advice on how to start their own business. My advice was to keep their day job, <laughs> practice hard, and take every kind of training they could, and to volunteer. Uh, I, I did a lot of my uh, school of hard knocks in the trenches volunteering for Operation Photo Rescue, which helps restore pictures uh, people have lost or had damaged in natural disasters like hurricanes. And it's a great training ground. Uh, I think that there may be a little more awareness now that digital restoration is a legitimate art form, but there are still a lot of people out there who need to be practicing on their own images instead of charging people to work on theirs. When you are looking for a digital restoration artist, ask to see samples of their work or look at their online portfolio. 
If they don't have examples off or online, or you notice only examples of say one thing, like everything they do is colorized, okay? Or they don't have really damaged examples, then you should move on to the next person. Um, by really bad, I don't mean a little damage on the edges. The, this one on the right here, there's a lot of damage on the edge. It's mostly on one edge and the upper part of one person's arm is gone. To somebody who knows what they're doing, that's nothing. That's easy peasy, okay? Uh, as long as it doesn't have, if it doesn't have any damage on the main subject, or if all the face on the original damaged is there and you can see it, like this tintype, that's, I'm not gonna say that one's easy, but you can see both of her eyes, you can see her nose, and you can see her mouth. So that's not going to be horribly hard. Don't let somebody let you see something like the one on the right and make, and make you believe that that's just horribly hard, because it's not. You have to be very, very critical when you look at their work, because the, these are your pictures they're gonna be working on. You wanna make sure they're the best. And if any, uh, anybody has anything that's probably not at least this bad, then they're not up to your standards. Okay, there, here are some other things to look for. I did not do these. So I'll let you know that. Um, if you see anything like this, then you need to move on to the next candidate. Again, look at these with a really critical eye. This first one here on the left, you can see that the person cut them out of the background and didn't even bother to restore the background. And that's not acceptable. The one next to it, that might look okay to you, but I can see something on the little girl on the left. Her face looks rather painted in. Doesn't look quite real. The one down there on the other end has got clone marks. That's an amateur mistake. When you're using a cloning tool and you're just taking your area that you're repairing from, from one single area, you get those repeat marks. Okay, if, if you can see that. Can anybody see those? Okay, that, if you see that, amateur mistake. This one in the middle, they took the good eye and flipped it, okay? And they didn't do anything to fix it. The poor guy's cross-eyed now. <laughs> and they flipped the ear too, which had nothing wrong with the bottom of the other ear. It looks like he's wearing earrings. <laughs> see? So, <laughs> and this, this last one, they, they actually kind of painted his face in. He's now got a painted face in a photograph. And these are, all, these are all cheats. These are just people who aren't as good as they need to be before they work on your pictures. So where do you find a restoration expert? Online is a great source because every studio should have an online portfolio that you can check their work. When finding your restorationist online, though, use caution. There are a lot of studios that originate overseas, and India seems to be the restoration capital of the world these days. Uh, most of these places outsource their work to people in those work from home, make millions things you see on the infomercials. And the way they make their money, first of all, they pay them hardly anything, like a couple dollars for each one. The only way they're gonna make any money at all is to do as many as they can. In fact, in this one, this is, I, I love this, you get overnight turnaround. If you upload the images in the evening, you'll receive your corrected images by the next morning. This is not a good thing, <laughs> okay? They, they try to make you think it is, but it's not. So you, even, even if I did get something done that quick, I would wait a day or two, and then I'd have to look at it again with fresh eyes to make sure I didn't you know, miss anything or if something couldn't be done better. Overnight turnaround, not a selling point. And down here's another thing you can look for. These people are very proud of their people that are certified. I'd like to see proof they're certified in Photoshop. But they're certified in Photoshop CS and Creative Suite Premium, uh, Creative Suite 2 Premium. We are now on Creative Suite 6 and Photoshop 6 at Adobe, and we're pretty soon we're, they're gonna start working, we you know, do the betas for them, and we're gonna start working on CS7. This is a new ad. <laughs> they're a little behind the times. They also, in order to get their things done fast, work in things like eye candy, 
which is a retouching program to make, you know, beauty retouching and all. The, they use plugins that uh, you can put your photo in and it does some of the restoration work for you, which is fine if you just have a couple scratches here and there, but it's not high-end photo restoration. The, the, your trick is to do as many as they can as fast as they can. That's the operative thing there. You get what you pay for. Okay, it's all there. You'll see a lot of digital photo restoration at low prices out there, $10, $15, $30. And you will probably get what you pay for. My price structure is estimate based, as I think any photo restoration should be. Uh, my price structure uh, goes up or down no matter if I look at it. If I'm looking at it in person, I just make an estimate on what I see and sometimes the people get a great deal because I put it in Photoshop and it's like, oops, it's a little worse than I thought. But you stick to that. If they really, really want their price up front and they don't want me to give an estimate, I tell them that I charge $125 an hour with a minimum of two hours. So see, you come out very good if you just let me look at it. <laughs> the highest amount I've ever charged for a restoration is $350 and that photograph was so damaged, I didn't think I'd be able to fix it. And I've only been able to not fix one photograph ever. And that was so badly water damaged that the person's face had washed away. That's another trick, by the way, I'll get here a sec, that people, if the faces are gone, they'll just stick anybody's face on there. They'll find a random picture and put their face. So you get that back and it's like, that's not my grandma. It's <laughs> another thing you gotta look for. I'm almost done. Keep that thought. Okay, so that's a little bit on photo conservation through repatriation, preservation, and digital photo restoration. I hope some of you are inspired to find some of your lost family pictures, preserve and archive the ones you have, and maybe have a few damaged ones digitally restored. I'd be happy to give estimates should anybody be interested, and our contact information is on that handout that we have in the other room in case anybody wants to get a hold of us. And I also teach and I'm an author with the lynda.com online training library. Has anybody ever heard of lynda.com? Yay. Yay, Linda. Okay, I have uh, two courses on lynda.com uh, should anybody want to learn it. So thank you all for being here and questions? Yes, sir. The restoration quality you pay for, assuming you're getting it, you're not, if you've got several, a lot of pictures, you don't want all those restored beautifully. You want maybe a few torn out places fixed, but you... Yeah, for something like that, you probably uh, stick to the ones that have the worst damage. For instance, if you're publishing a book or something and you right. have a few photographs in it, right. they don't all necessarily, you don't advocate, advocate going here and spending uh, several hundred dollars. I'm real big on, uh, on restoration because I think that you owe it to the people who's looking, who are looking at the picture to see the picture closer to what it was, unless the book or the thing you're trying to convey is on the damage of the photo. Um, I don't see a lot of value in having a really damaged photo in a book, but as far as like lightly damaged and stuff, no, I'd probably just stick with the ones. That would get too costly. And if, you cost, if it costs too much and you charge, that's why I'd try not to charge too much, because then nobody could afford restoration. So. Anyone else? You mentioned the gold CDs. What about the uh, uh, DVDs and things like that for storing photos? The reason I like the archival series with the CDs, they are specifically made for archiving photos. Um, DVDs, if you get a better quality one, would be fine, especially if you have like a slideshow presentation or something. Um, that's A DVD holds a lot more. That's one good thing, and if you have a huge collection, that's fine. But Really, as long as you go in every, you know, every once in a while, make sure that everything's okay. If you get cheaper quality CDs or DVDs, we really don't know how they're gonna hold up yet. You could go in and you could put them in something and all your information could be lost. You know, technology changes so quick, you just really don't know. If the originals are either slides or negatives, uh, how do you suggest storing them and how do you suggest restoring them? Uh, they're mostly 40 to 50 years old. The uh, archival products and the museum things have sp special things for negatives. 
for storing negatives, boxes and sleeves and the whole bit, and you need to find somebody with a scanner that does negatives. I've got actually one of the uh, few better scanners that do negatives now. A lot of people have to get um, dedicated negative scanners, which cost two and three hundred dollars, and is a, they're a waste of money unless it's your business. So you need to find someone that has uh, holders for negatives, and then scan them, and you work on them just like you would any other picture. What is the scanner you use for negatives? Uh, an Epson V700. 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 Yeah. Yay! <laughs> it's one of the few that uh, has the negative holders. Okay. What do you recommend for photographs that have been previously scrapped? First of all, the black pages are acid death. Yeah. They're yeah. horrible. Yeah. They're, they're horrible. They will eat through your picture. Uh, you need to get them out as best you can. If you can't, peel them off. You cut them out. You know, sometimes they use the glue that was, that was when glue was glue. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and the glue is acidic. Yeah. They didn't know. Nobody knew that it was, but you need to get as much of that off as you can. There are special little spatulas that you can try to peel them off. You have to be very careful. Don't use hair dryers or any of those things. You just don't know what those things are going to do to them. And if you have to, I have some photos that were in a black photo album. The glue has the black stuff. It doesn't come off. We just have to store them, but store them separate from all your other pictures. Uh, it's on the bottom or something? Yeah, it's like, yeah, because they're glued in the book and then he's... Cut them out with it? Or, or just keep it in a, like, put the photo in a sleeve okay. and then put it in another sleeve with but the... Separate. Separate. Together. Separate, but together. Separate. Yeah. In Grand Prairie, the Grand Prairie Genealogical Society did a group buy of uh, archival boxes and other material and uh, through Gaylord. Now, you didn't mention Gaylord. Gaylord's a library supply company. Right. And large libraries get uh, remarkable discounts, and the Grand Prairie Library got a discount. And so our members were able to get all of their material at 40% of retail and no shipping. Yeah. So you don't have to pay retail, and you don't even have to pay the 15% right. off that you find on the web. Right. With just a little bit of effort, you can save a huge amount of money on archival and, and supplies. It, it has everything to do with bulk. That. Yeah, it's yeah, for the, large, large groups and stuff, but that is a good idea to get like a consortium together or something and buy that way. That's an excellent idea. Yep. Yeah. I'd just like to make one comment that may be a little, there may be a little confusing. If you, it's not that important because you said it's safe and it's tip, but if you scan a, a photo and save it as a JPEG file, just opening the file will not destroy the original JPEG. But it, it is if you open that JPEG and then save it again. Right, exactly. So, yeah, so you, you don't well, destroy. You're probably going to be doing it. Exactly. If you're going to be photo retouching, right. don't do it in JPEG. Right. Yeah. right. And it's, just, it's, just a, it's probably just a good benchmark to anything that's archival, period, should be in TIFF. That's. Yes? I do use a digital camera to take pictures of the convex ovals or anything in a frame that I can't scan. I'm not a photographer. Um, that's another misconception. A lot of people think that anybody that's a photographer is automatically a restoration artist or and vice versa. It's not so because the only thing digital restoration has to do with photography is that the picture was taken in the first place. But um, I don't have all the filters that you need to make it really good. I just, I do the best I can and use the highest uh, resolution I can and, and all that. But yeah, I do use it on the frame pictures because I don't like to take pictures out of the frame, especially the old ones. And if you take the convex ovals out of the frame, by the way, they collapse on themselves. So it is safe to scan a daguerreotype or a tintype? Sure. You bet. It sure is. Now, the, the daguerreotypes more than likely are going to be in those cases. And again, you don't want to open those yourself, but you can just lay the case on it because it's a shallow enough frame that it's, it's probably going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Yes, ma'am, back there. 
You mentioned amber types earlier. Huh? I've never heard of that before. What's the difference between an amber type and a tin type? Amber types were made. Their their process involved um, uh, albumin, which is part of an egg white, and it's just a different process. Um, can you tell the difference between the two? Well, that's a whole different presentation on how you can do that. Um, they just look different. Tin types, you know a tin type uh, when you see it. Um, that would be a little, we can talk later. <laughs> it can be a little long on how you do that. That's a whole different presentation on how you can figure out what, what's what. But, uh, but yeah. I mean, it's a just difference. Yeah, yeah and, and it's not going to be like a tin type. A tin type, uh, you know, the thing, the selling point with tin types were they weren't as delicate as daguerreotypes, which is kind of funny now because if you look at them crosswise, they crumple. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, I have some pictures that I don't know if they were original or if they were uh, scanned copies that my mother in law just died and she had them framed hanging in her den. Right. And I've left them in the frame and I've put them inside a plastic under the bed container which obviously is going to eat them alive but do I leave them in the frame and what do I do? Uh, they're very old. They look very old. They're pictures back in the 1800s, uh, a lot of them. I, unless the frame comes off, if it's one of those frames that come off really easily, um, then I'd leave it in the frame. And the thing with the older frames, you just have to know that if you take it out, you may not get it back in because unless you like put new nails and everything in the back of those frames because the brads that they used are going to be more delicate. Uh, you can find somebody at frame shop. Obviously newer. So well, if, if the frames are newer, I'd take them out. Okay. It's just, it's really the, like the convex ovals, the ones that are, because uh, those are pretty much sealed in there. And like I said, if you take them out of the frame, they collapse on themselves. So that would be very bad. But if it's a newer frame, then you probably shouldn't worry about it. Just be careful how you get the photo itself out. Okay, that it? Yes, ma'am. It seems like there's a lot of interest in saving photos around here. I, as an idea, somebody buy a scanner and charge us $20 an hour or so to use it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can take care of that for you. <laughs> and I probably wouldn't even charge $20 an hour. No, that's... Uh, Oh, come on, give us a break. Use us. <laughs> uh, I know when, when my parents passed away and such, we, we inherited the whole scheme of those uh, types of numbers. Uh, and, of course, we also inherited the negatives. So if, uh, if you have a negative, you can always reprint and, because the other picture is in a uh, We were fairly lucky in a lot of those that we were able to get them out. But you have to preserve the negatives now. You know, I, I really shouldn't be talking all that much because I've still got some work to do, too. So, <laughs> Ma'am, you had a question? Yes. What about Polaroid photos? Is there anything to do to preserve them? Because they're so digitally. You give your photo collection, try it in its entirety, but anything, give it to an archive or a historical society or anybody like that, the family can always go and visit the collection. And then they all know where it is. And everybody has access to it. If you just continue to give a piece here and a piece there and a piece there, then you're going to lose pieces of your history. But that's a very good point. Very good. Is that it? Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.